Welcome to Mic Drop, the podcast where relevancy is irrelevant and we don't give a shit about your feelings. All right, ladies and gentlemen, uh, this is Mike Ritland with the Mic Drop series. This is Team Dog 002, where I uh, take questions from uh, from the folks that uh, are generous enough to give a shit about what I talk about. Uh, on social media platforms and uh, I've got a handful of questions that uh, that I'm going to go through I'm going to try to answer a few more maybe with a little shorter answers this time just because there's so many of them um, with, without a doubt you know keep in mind that uh, you know there's there's elements of what you're going to hear me talk about that uh, are, are a bit repetitive but uh, one, one thing in terms of beating the dead horse that I hope you realize is that the principles are really all the same with all the problems that I see, um, you know, there's there's just a, a lot of consistency with the reason as to why they're happening. So keep that in mind. Uh, we're going to jump right into it, um, and we're going to get started off some questions. Uh, th- these are from uh, from Twitter. So this is uh, Mike Perez asks, "How do I get my Roddy to stop lunging at other dogs or anything while walking him on leash? He's very stubborn." It's a great question. It's also one that I get a lot. A lot of people have issues with walking their dogs on a, on a leash and them being reactive. So uh, this is one of the things I, I actually talked a fair bit about in the last podcast and that I talk a lot about with my online training. But um, that, the, the gist of it is, you know, and what you'll see with a lot of these behaviors is you've got to teach him how to walk on a leash and it needs to be in an environment where there's not a bunch of distractions first. So it's just like anything else where you're learning something in a classroom is that, you know, you're not going to go learn quantum physics when you're at, uh, you know, a water slide park, right? Is that, uh, that's what you're trying to do is if you haven't taught him how to, how to walk on a leash properly, when there's not a bunch of stuff going on, going on, he's going to have a hard time doing it, but it needs to be graduated and stair stepped up. So you got to get a lot of repetitions of shaping and, and teaching that desired uh, walking on a leash and, and mostly paying attention to you, which is really what it boils down to is that you want to, reinforce and reward uh, over and over and over your dog paying attention to you. Um, and in the first three months of the online training, it focuses really, really heavy on that. So you're building that foundation. I would recommend going on there. Again, it's going to sound like a shameless plug, but uh, but that's the case. Like I can explain it to you all day, but to watch the videos and see how it's structured uh, is really what's going to going to help you out there. But uh, if you don't want to do that and you just want the, the nickels worth of free advice, it's teach your dog to, to stop uh, or to, to start walking on a leash properly when there's nothing else but you to focus on and get a lot of repetitions to where it becomes kind of a conditioned behavior, second nature type of thing, and uh, and then gradu- gradually introduce uh, more challenging environments. Don't go from walking in your backyard on a leash where there's nothing going on right out to the most challenging environment. You want to graduate it and scale it up. Uh, this one comes from Michael, which is uh, Enzo Louis 74 on Twitter. Uh, heat and humidity getting pretty high. I happen to think dogs are tougher than most think, and they make it pretty obvious when they're too hot. But what are some danger signs and best way to cool them down if need be? Pool, tub, garden hose, shade, AC, etc. Great question, Mike. Um, Obviously, this time of year, it's it's already, here in Texas, it's uh, god-awful fucking hot already. Um, So there's a couple things. Um, Number one is, is keeping the dog, and this is one that I think gets overlooked a lot, is keeping the dog lean. Just like with human beings, uh, if you're a total fat ass, you're going to overheat a lot quicker than you are if you're lean and trim and in good shape. So uh, that is the single most important component to keeping a dog cool, in my opinion, is to don't let them be a total fat ass. Um, That's number one. Number two is that use a little bit of common sense and that uh, generally speaking, now some dogs have longer coats, some of them have undercoats or dual coated and so they're a little more protected from sun. Some of them are short coated, some of them are white and and can sunburn easily. You know, there's a lot of different variables that are going to dictate how fast your dog uh, overheats above and beyond whether or not it's a fat ass or not. Uh, But use some common sense and that being in broad sunlight... uh, uh, or broad daylight rather uh, is going to heat them up faster and so you know have shade accessible if you're walking them try to do it in, in places where it's shade keep in mind that uh, pavement asphalt specifically is is god awful hot um, and it's hard on their pads also you see lots of instances of dogs being walked where an owner's wearing fucking shoes and walking on asphalt in 105 degrees and they end up burning the shit out of their dog's pads don't be a dick don't do that think about that 
Um, in terms of signs and symptoms, um, the, the thing that I generally look at the most, um, just like I think most people probably do, is, is their mouth. Uh, obviously, dogs pant to cool off. Um, what they also do, however, there's two things. Is One, they also uh, perspire and, and, um, and dissipate some heat through, the, through their, their pads also. So, um, again, keep in mind the, the heat factor of the ground. But what I look at mostly is their tongue. Now, when a dog starts panting and their tongue is hanging out, starts hanging out further and further when it when it goes from just hanging out in their panting to where it's it curls back over on itself like a soup ladle to me that's when you you've got to stop uh, exercising them uh and and find them a cooler place that's that's when they're in my opinion kind of crossing over into the all right now they're getting too hot um if they're not that way um i'll continue to work them not necessarily until they get to that point uh, some of it is knowing your dog and paying close attention, but uh, that tongue soup ladle thing is uh, is, a, is a big factor. In, to, in terms of cooling them off, uh, air movement is a big thing. Uh, you know, keeping a, a fan or or in a breezeway or somewhere you know again out of direct sunlight where there's a good amount of air flowing through. Um, one of the things you'll notice a dog does is when they pant if they're really hot, especially like if they're in a crate or in a, in a more enclosed area, it's pronounced and exaggerated is they'll move their head around so that they're not breathing in their, uh, their exhalation, uh, which is hotter than the normal air temp. So um, what that tells you is basic physics, but uh, the dogs also get that. And so if you give them a good stream of, of cool air blowing uh, you know, towards their face and their mouth, whatever, that can help dissipate that and help them cool off, that's a, that's a bonus. Um, something cool to lay on is important. Uh, cold tile, cold concrete. Uh, things like grass and, and uh, brush and, and or things that are already warm are, are going to either not let them cool down very fast or in some instances exacerbate it, so be careful with that. Uh, also, you can put uh, cold cold packs underneath their thighs, like between their groin area and, and their thigh muscle. That area is, is a good way to cool them down. Uh, same with really cold water, same thing. You just you need to be a little careful. Uh, in that getting them too cool too fast can cause problems too like I wouldn't you wouldn't want to throw them in a bath of ice water Necessarily because uh, that, that can can be too big of a shock to their system if you cool them down too fast. I think um, So yeah, you know give them fresh stream of air cold water on their thighs um, Or in the inside uh, their thighs with a cold pack uh, something really really cool to lay on um, I, I typically don't like to hose them down um, necessarily like if they're crossing that bridge into where they're starting to, to stroke out on you. Um, if, if they're just hot and they want to cool off and jump in water by themselves, hey, I, I let them do that. I do like to have a little kiddie pool filled with, uh, with cool water uh, when we exercise our dogs so that if they want to jump in there on their own, they can. But in terms of once they cross over into, into too hot, I don't typically like to cover them in, in water um, for the simple fact that, you know, unless you're continually doing it, and they have the ability to, to move around some. Uh, I think in some instances it can it can make them hotter once they get out of the water, and and uh, you know it's a lot of extra weight for them to carry, and, and uh, makes them exert more more physical um, energy to uh, and, and can in my opinion overheat them a little bit further. So I like to keep it on the inside of their thighs or their armpits, uh, their their undercarriage where it's easy to get to their organs and their and their uh, hair is thinner. Um, but anyway, great question. And, uh, you know, one, one thing that, that, uh, a lot of times people overlook a uh, big thing again, keep your dog thin. Um, barefoot Cairo, uh, asks, my dog has no desire to play with any type of toy or ball or bone. Is there a way to get him to engage with these stimuli so that I can exercise slash play with him at the moment? All we do is walking. I'd love to expand on his activity level. Well, wouldn't we all barefoot Cairo? Um, no, it's a good question, and it's actually a common one. Here's the problem: is and the short answer is maybe. Um, you know, genetically, uh, that's going to dictate by and large what the dog's drive is. You know, I I see and hear and read a lot of people talk about drive building and and things of that nature, and I think uh, it's more nuanced than it is kind of a a big picture trait that you can work on because just like you know people have certain levels of, of genetic drives or or whatever for certain things you can tweak them a little bit uh, you can't make enormous corrections or shifts with a few exceptions to me even a dog with a ton of drive if you punish them hard enough can you stifle it sure um, 
but in my opinion, that drive still exists. It's just um, the dog understands that if it if it uh, employs it, that it's going to be punished to the point where where they're willing to shut down over it. So I I don't really consider that the same thing. But in this case, um, for, to me, frustration is your best friend. Now. Um, I like to use food uh, typically in a dog like this where I'll feed them through training. And I talk about that again in the first couple months of of the online training of using food uh, through reinforcement or, or reinforcing through using food uh, to kind of get that desire to work up first. Um, a lot of times people, you know, the dog's, you know, a little overweight and not hungry at all. And they're out there, you know, the dog's kind of lazy and they're trying to entice them with a ball lean them out, use food so that they understand working for something first. If the dog has no genetic drive for balls, toys, whatever, see if you can get him to have drive for something first. And and the easiest thing to use for that is food so that they at least understand what working for something is like from there. Then I like to use frustration um, and I like to build frustration. So, um, you know, every dog is going to have some prey drive to some extent, even if it's so minuscule, you can't recognize it. Like there, there is going to be something there that if you back tie the dog, i.e. put them on a, on a tether of some sort and use like a flirt pole with a rag and, and entice them with it, fluff it in front of their face. Almost all dogs at some point, you can get them to show some interest in it. Um, and that's what I, I would do to start is, is, you know, basically tease them, uh, with, with toys, with rags, with, you know, things that are going to incite, if there is any ounce of, of genetic prey drive whatsoever that exists, see what caliber it's at. Now the dog understands what it's like to work for something. Um, see if you can get that out of them and, and, and then build on that as best you can. You are going to be limited by the dog's genetics. Uh, there's no two ways about it is that you, you can't put something that's there that's not there. Uh, but what is there, you can maximize it. It's just, you know, if there's almost no, nothing there, then you're going to be maximizing so so little that you may not be able to do a whole lot with it, and that that is a limitation. That's a genetic limitation that uh, that you can't fix. But that's how I would go about it. Uh, Jeremy, which is at Rages at the Stars, uh, asks, "How can nutrition affect behavior in dogs?" Fantastic fucking question, Jeremy, um, and one that I I find gets enormously overlooked. Uh, in dog training, especially as it relates to your average everyday pet owner. Um, it, it, the, the short answer is enormously, you know, just like with uh, how, how big of an impact nutrition has on us as human beings in terms of our behavior, uh, and especially kids. It's one thing that, that I advocate for a lot is like with school lunches or kids is that, you know, that, that's the most important time to feed them really, really super clean diets while everything of theirs is uh, developing their brains, their bones, their, you know, not just their bones, I mean, their entire skeletal frame, their central nervous system, thyroid, all, you know, all of that shit. Uh, it's, it's, it's especially important not to, you know, be living off of corn dogs and nuggets and fucking Cheetos uh, and apple juice, which, you know, so many kids do. And I think that's why there's so many problems. But dogs are the same way, um, especially when they're young, but even when they're old uh, or mature, rather. Uh, feeding them good, clean diets, ideally raw or freeze dried if it's done right, um, and then uh, you know good, high quality kibble thereafter. Um, but yeah, it, it makes a huge difference. So does keeping them lean, just like I was talking about just a minute ago. Uh, with the heat thing, is that keeping them lean and, and and healthy makes a big difference too. You know, if if you're being fed shit food and you're grossly overweight, like you're not going to be very driven to to work hard. You know, your cognition's going to be impaired. Uh, physically, you're going to be a train wreck. You're going to feel like shit. Like you're, you're just not going to be as productive. So, feeding a good food and keeping them in an in a ideal body weight and condition standpoint makes an enormous difference. So, uh, that's a great question. Uh, Greg Minton um, asks thoughts on breed restrictions. Lots of apartments and rentals won't allow my little buddy. Looks like he's probably a pit bull or, or a mix of some sort. I can't stand breed restrictions. Uh, I think they're fucking stupid um, and it drives me nuts. Um, you know, they are what they are, um, you know, vote with your wallet, so to speak, and that, uh, you know, don't, don't live there. Uh, you can, you can certainly try to, uh, educate people and I, I would, uh, recommend and, and advocate, uh, to that. But, um, the reality of it is, is that, you know, breed restrictions are, um, really not any different than racism from my perspective. 
is that you're you're lumping all of something you know lumping a, a specific breed of of dog that uh, that to me has has no bearing on uh, necessarily how they're going to behave. Um, I've seen really good examples of every breed, and I've seen very poor examples of every breed. Uh, and I think it's uh, it's an archaic principle. Uh, it's a knee jerk, emotional based reaction that uh, people that know exactly fuck all about dogs typically try to enact to make it seem like they're doing something about it. Um, and I think it's stupid. I think educating people how to not be fucking morons with their dogs uh, is far more effective and appropriate than lumping together, uh, you know, this breed is bad or, or whatever. And that, and that goes for all of them. You know, it's not just, you know, the, the breeds that you typically hear about, i.e. pit bulls, Dobermans, Rottweilers, etc. You know, there's there's labs, there's German Shepherds, there's, you know, uh, Irish Setters. I mean, you, Vieslas. I mean, there, there's every, every example I can think of um, that I've seen really, really good examples and really, really poor examples. So uh, I, I wish that it didn't exist. I think it's dumb. All right. What is uh, Mr. France? underscore math i'm not sure what the hell that means but uh, yeah right uh asks what is a good way to teach my shepherd to bring a ball back when i throw it for her also what are some techniques for starting to train a dog to be off the leash two very common and, and regular uh good questions that i get um the short answer with bringing the ball back is have another ball you know put yourself in the dog's shoes right they've got the ball what what are you offering at that point if they have the ball why, why would she bring it back you know, have you taught her to bring it back? Uh, it sounds like no. You're asking how to how to teach her that. Well, have have another ball and make your ball sexier than the one that she has by inciting her prey drive and building on frustration, just like I was talking about. Have another ball, bounce it, run away from her with it, throw it, bounce it against the wall. Pr you know, play with it on your by yourself and ignore her. And she's going to be like, well, shit, the party's over there with dad and the other ball. Let me go fuck with that. Um, that's how, that's how you do it. The second she comes over and, and, uh, get her to drop the other ball by, by using your ball to entice her to drop it. The second she does with, with your marker, I generally in my recommendation would be a clicker, mark that and throw the other ball. That's teaching her that, Hey, if you bring that ball back, you're going to get the other one. That's how it starts. And then you, you remove the second ball after you've gotten enough repetitions to where they understand, Hey, I come back, throws it again. And you build on that. Um, there's a, a lesson in my online training where I, I specifically, you know, the entire lesson is getting a, a really stubborn bastard of a dog to let go of something. And, and you see how painstaking the process can be for the first couple of sessions in, in making just minute microscopic levels of progress and having to use those to mark and, and teach and, and build uh, the dog on because if the dog's several years old and has never been taught that and in the transverse has been reinforced to, to be possessive and, and guardy of, of things then you have your work cut out for you and it's gonna it's gonna take those little little micro baby steps of progress to mark and reinforce that to build off of and shape and actually teach the dog uh, that, that letting go is a good thing it may it may take you some time but go with that um, in terms of teaching off leash same thing just you know what I talk about in my my training course is um, is you know setting up a classroom and, and teaching them all of the desired behaviors, whether it's off leash or whatever it is that you're trying to teach them. Teach them in a nice sterile classroom, lots of repetitions, shaping it, marking and reinforcing, and then uh, and then just uh, building off of that and scaling up the distractions so that you're not going from the classroom out into the most challenging environment and uh, go from there. Uh, Richard Ledyard says, hey, Mike, my dog barks at every tiny noise that happens around our house. He knows it's against the rules and looks guilty every time, but still does it. How do I change that behavior? Okay. First of all, Richard, uh, he knows it's against the rules and looks guilty every time. You're, you're anthropomorphizing it a smidge on that, I think, uh, but still does it. If he knows it's against the rules, um, I, I would beg to differ. Um, and knowing that something is against the rules is, is again, is giving him a little more credit than he deserves. And the reason I say that is that there's a lot of logic and reason. The thing that you have to understand about dogs, and this is the probably the, the biggest and most fundamental textbook principle that exists, in my opinion, in dog training, is that their mind works like a calculator, not like ours. They don't think in a language. Everything is A plus B equals C, right? Is that, you know, he's making simple associations. He's not reasoning through the process of well the last time he that i barked and he did the, they're not going through that process they're making an association with when i bark a 
plus B equals your reaction equals C, the outcome, essentially. And, and so what you need to do is, is to teach him both to bark and to stop barking. And there's, a, there's another video in my online training where I do exactly that, is that you set him up for failure, or in this case, success, uh, in that barking is something that all dogs are going to do. Some dogs like to bark more than others. What you need to do is teach him there is a time to bark and there's a time to shut the hell up. You know, dogs are going to bark. You, you should want them to bark at certain things, in my opinion. Plus, it's natural. If you, if you stifle a dog and, and only teach him, don't bark ever, shut the hell up all the time, that's, a, that's kind of a miserable existence for a dog. And so, in other words, teach them how to, how to uh, from an impulse control standpoint, how to cap that drive to want to bark by teaching them to bark. And then the instant they shut up, you mark and reward it. The way I like to do it is with a ball. You can use whatever it is that the dog is crazy about, but go into your classroom that we've that we've just been talking about and stand there with something that he wants to the point uh, where he's so frustrated he'll start barking. And you stand there with it and be very stoic and ignore him. The second he stops barking, you mark it with your clicker and you give him whatever it is that you have that he wants, whether it's a treat, throw a ball, whatever, and then do it over and over and over and over. And he, he will learn to shut up. As soon as he gets that, hey, every time I shut up, I get the ball, he'll start shutting up more and more and more. And again, there's a video that, that I, I show this process, uh, you know, in its entirety. Um, but uh, that that's the gist of it. So then uh, you once that understanding is there, then you're going to couple it with a command to whatever it is, you know, shut up or stop or quiet or whatever command it is that you want to use to stop barking. And then you do both. Teach him, okay, bark. He barks. Now tell him to shut up. He shuts up. You give him the reward. Teach him to bark, teach him to shut it up. And then, um, you know, you can tell him, hey, be quiet. Don't be quiet. And, and give him an outlet to do that so that there's there's a black and white, a right and left flank, if you will, as to, as to when to shut up and, and when it's okay to bark. Uh, and then incorporate that into your household where you're saying, okay, you can bark now. Okay, now shut up. And then just build off of the amount of time that you're keeping him quiet so that he's thinking about it, he's focusing on it. He's not just arbitrarily barking for no damn reason. Um, and then there's, there's not that, uh, he knows it's against the rules and looks guilty every time. My, my bet without saying it is that you're pissed off and your reaction is what he's basing his, you think he knows what, what the rules are and looks guilty is that you're pissed. And, uh, even if you don't think you're displaying it, I would bet that you are. And he's picking up on that and that's, that's what's driving that. But he doesn't really understand that it's his barking that's causing that. If, if I'm a betting man. All right. Um, Thank you for this one-year-old. I don't know who uh, who wrote this for some reason. It's uh, it's in a note um, when I pulled it up. But um, one-year-old German Shepherd scared of other dogs. Hair goes up on sight of, on them of them on walks. If they show sudden movement, she reacts by lunging and barking. I've been taking her to obedience classes with ten plus dogs in them, and she does very well in them. She just pays other dogs a lot of attention, but doesn't react. She's e-collar conditioned and trained. Uh, have used any collar corrections on this issue, but she keeps making the mistake of reacting. How can I make my walks more enjoyable? I've tried taking a tug so I can distract her and it works reasonably well, but not 100%. All right. So same thing, go to your classroom, ditch the, uh, the 10 dogs obedience classes. You should be teaching your dog the obedience by yourself first. In my opinion, I don't like group classes. I know a lot of fucking people use them and they use them for those desensitization things. I don't do that. I'm not saying it's wrong. I just, I don't, I don't do it that way. I know there's people that have some success and there's plenty of trainers out there that do a lot of group classes and, and to each their own. I'm certainly not bad mouthing them. There's a lot of different ways to climb that fucking tree. My opinion is go in the classroom, teach the dog to focus on you no matter what the fuck is going on and build from there is that you're teaching that focus and it starts with eye contact. I mark and reward the shit out of eye contact over and over and over in my classroom. Every time they check in, look at my eyes, bam, mark and reward, mark and reward and feed that way for weeks to get to where the dog is only paying attention to you and then I, I introduce distractions on my terms. You know, I, I don't want them focused on other dogs. And, and so what you'll find is that by, by going about it that way, and there, there's a couple of online lessons that I, that I both talk about this and, and demonstrate it because it is so, so vital part, such a vital part of the process, is that you are, in, in essence, teaching the dog that, that the world is you. And everything comes from you and, and that when no matter what's going on and, and you can take a dog that, that historically and previously when they see other dogs, they lose their shit over it is that when you teach them the instant they see that 
they focus on me and I mark and reward that. So it can't just be with a tug when you're out being challenged. You need to go back to take a couple steps back, go to the classroom and teach that dog from there, uh, that method. So, uh, that would be my, my recommendation. Um, I'm going to sound like a, a shameless, uh, fucking used car salesman here with the online training, but I, I can tell you every single person there's, and I know one of them is an actual online training member, uh, but they're just uh, you know a couple weeks into it. Is that every one of you who have asked these questions thus far uh, would benefit from um, the online training, and and these questions would be answered both in the videos and in the forums. Um, so, I mean, I'm I'm happy to answer these questions for free uh, online, uh, but it's it's a it's one piece of the puzzle. Uh, and you know, there's a lot of other pieces there that, uh, that you need, frankly, but, uh, it's not complicated. Um, all right. So now I'm jumping into the Instagram platform. There's a, an ass load of questions here. I'm going to try to get to as many of them as I can. Uh, Eric Shenton, actually first working dog, dry goods. How are your friends in Oklahoma? So impossibly good looking. Well, I, I would, uh, probably leverage that by saying you're in Oklahoma um, and, uh, let's be honest, you're not really, uh, not really, uh, flooding the Hollywood scene with, with folks from Oklahoma in terms of the good looks category. I'm just fucking with you guys. Uh, anyway, I, I love, I love Oklahoma. You're right to the North of me and, uh, it's good people, but I had to bust your chops if you're going to fuck with me on that one. Anyway, uh, Eric Shenton, what is the most valuable piece of advice you could give to any handler new or seasoned? Great question. And this isn't just handler. This is, uh, you know, if, if you're using the term handler professionally or just in general, I, I would generalize it and say, put yourself in the dog's shoes every single time, every time. All right. It, it, you have to look at the training world through your dog's eyes. It does not matter what you think, just like a coach with their athletes, a, an employer uh, with employees, a, a parent with their kids student with their te or a teacher with their students it's all the same is that you you have to understand how they're interpreting the the lesson you know because if they don't get it it doesn't matter how how much sense it makes to you or how you're rationalizing it if the dog doesn't understand that or any of the other people in those categories i listed that, that are the ones that you're trying to teach something if they don't understand what the expectations are what the criteria is what the fucking goal is of what you're trying to accomplish then you are wasting your time and you're causing frustration in the dog and yourself. Uh, and that doesn't do either one of you any good. So put yourself in the dog's shoes and, and in conjunction with that, realize that that dog does not think in a language and views the world through a plus B equals C a, a calculator mentality uh, and, and use that as the backdrop for everything that you do. Keep that in the forefront of your mind. Every time you try to teach your dog interact with it, do anything is think about the associations being made. Um, all right. So next question, uh, how much of a dog's grip do you think is genetic and how important it is for real working dogs compared to sport dogs? It, so for me, I think a lot of it is genetic, um, to put a percentage on it, it it's at least half. Um, but the, I, I'd say it's probably half. Um, uh, the other half is, is how you, how you train it. Uh, I won't spend a lot of time talking about it cause it's, you know, from a mainstream standpoint, most people don't really give a shit how their dogs bite things other than working dog folks. In terms of real working dogs compared to sport dogs, I think it's important for both. I don't make a distinction that it's more important for one or the other. I mean, in terms of people's lives being on the line, yes, of course, working dogs in terms of on the street as a police dog, it's it's vital. Um, in terms of sport dogs, it's you know it depends on the sport and their points and all that. But uh, you know it's nurture and nature, not uh, not one or the other. Uh, just an uh, underside two times asks, um, and that was Bomber Bolton, sorry, that was asking the other one. Uh, underside two times, just adopted a blue nose American pit bull. He's only nine weeks old, very friendly, and almost never barks unless I put him in the crate. How would I train the dog basic obedience such as to be quiet, come to me, and not jump up on people? Um, short answer, join the online training. Um, but in terms of one thing, in, in terms of the, of the crate, it's a, it's a pretty common question. I mean, come to you and jump on people is, is shaping through reinforcement, just like with, with everything else that we're talking about, using your classroom, uh, et cetera. But uh, the crate thing is one thing that, that I'm going to talk about real quick. Um, in terms of people not understanding that, you know, how, A, how important a crate is, and B, how to actually implement it properly. Number one is that that crate is, is, 
is really a a such an under utilized and um, undervalued piece of equipment I, I would say it's the most important piece of gear early on in that dog's life that you possess and the reason for that is that it, it is a neutrality in terms of stimuli that uh, that is paramount to your success here's why it's paramount is that that is what's going to equalize all of the other things that are way cooler than you are is that if your dog has access to other dogs and outside or loose in the house or whatever and has free roam, free reign, free interaction, can self-reward at will and has no interaction with you for 22 hours a day and the other two hours you're trying to train the dog, guess what? You've got 22 hours to two hours that you're fighting against to try to uh, you know, bide for, for that dog's attention. You're never going to win that battle ever. I don't care how good of a trainer you are. I don't, I don't care how driven the dog is, is that if, if that's the disparity in, in time that, that you're training versus the dog can do whatever the hell it wants, essentially, you're, ne- you're never going to win that. It's going to take you 10 years uh, you know, to get any, anything done with a dog. Create the dog. People say, well, I don't want to create my dog. He, he whines and barks, and, and I think it's mean. Stop it. Just fucking stop it, all right? It, it, it's, it's not mean. Okay, it's vital to you being able to train your dog not to be an asshole, not to be dangerous, not to make your life a, a, a living hell. Um, but that's the first half is, is that you've got to use that just like militaries, police academies have been doing for, you know, hundreds of thousands of years militarily is that, you know, it's that total immersion. It's that, you know, nothing is going on except when you're working with me and now I'm shaping your behavior. And so now by default, that dog is going to be super, super interested in you. All right, and that is what you need early on. That does not mean that you need to create your dog the entire life of the dog, just like boot camp doesn't last 20 years. It lasts two months, you know, and proportionately for a dog, a few months of, of creating them other than when you're working with them sets that tone, sets the foundation, and is the backbone for everything else and is going to set you up for success and make your life one whole hell of a lot easier. Um, it's paramount. So do that. Uh, but then... The other side of that coin is that teach the dog that it's part of the training process. Don't just throw him in there, lock the door, and and leave him in there for 10 hours. Teach him to go in there the same way that we're teaching anything else is that incorporate that into using uh, your your marker and your reinforcers to teach the dog to go in there. And there's a couple videos, again, where I I show how to do that also. but it's it's not any different than any other thing that you're trying to teach is that you want to show interest in the crate to begin with and then feed them in their you know uh, shape and condition through self discovery for the dog to go in there and and, and load up on his own not using force not using e collars etc uh, using positive associations to to get him to to associate those things with that so that they're not freaking out and panicking and whining and whatever. And they get used to that as being part of their deal. Uh, and that's how you do it. So uh, do that. Um, all right, McGee, yes, sir. I have a six-month chocolate lab puppy. He's a great dog. We're currently teaching him basic commands. Stay is currently troubling one for him. Any tips? Also, what age can he start jogging and running hills with me? All right. So I'm going to answer the second part of the question first. At what age? I would wait uh, a little while. I would wait, um, frankly, I mean, exercise him. But I... I am a big proponent of waiting until the dog from a frame standpoint is essentially full grown before you're really doing lots of incline long distance uh, hikes and and jogs on hard pavement and things of that nature. Also, I would again recommend to keep him lean during the whole life, but especially the the growing process is to don't keep a bunch extra weight on him. Also, don't neuter him. Uh, He needs those hormones and I'll get into that here uh, later, but uh, all of those things combined are going to help. Uh, in terms of the stay command, again, teaching the place command first, um, you know, which is, uh, I think, the third lesson. Um, but, you know, early on, there's, there's a number of lessons where I, I teach the place command. Um, and actually, my next, next lesson, the, the June lesson for this year, um, is going to be uh, what that looks like right out of the gate. But teaching the dog place first so that they understand, okay, go to this spot. And then from there, once they understand that, where you have what they want and they have to go away to get it, that's kind of the light bulb moment operant conditioning-wise, in my opinion. And uh, 
once they understand that they have to go away from from what they want to actually get it then you can just build on and scale up the amount of time that the dog is staying there and, and work your way up from a few seconds to a few minutes to to where you know however long until you come back and that's that's the gist of it um all right, I have a four year uh, Chelsea underscore Cole. I have a four year old Jack Russell Cocker Spaniel. He's pretty obedient until I start to vacuum. Been using an e collar on him, but that does not stop him. He'll growl when I shock him and then proceed on attacking the vacuum. All right, I'm not I'm not going to pick on you here, Chelsea, but uh, this is a very common response: is that the reason why uh, you know he's you know reactively aggressive towards the the vacuum is because he doesn't understand it. It probably scares him a little bit, and he's defaulting to reactive aggression towards it. So by you stimulating him with, with punishment, uh, using positive punishment or adding punishment is exacerbating the problem, which is exactly what you're seeing. Um, so there's a couple things is that one, he needs to be exposed to that uh, where there's n nothing else going on and it's quite a ways away. Make positive associations with it right now. Um, you know, you're, you're associating punishment and, and, uh, and from a societal standpoint, negative uh, associations, not negative from an operant conditioning standpoint where you're removing it, uh, but negative in terms of, of the actual vocabulary word, um, is that he, he's got a, a lot of baggage with that, that vacuum cleaner. So what I like to do is, you know, run the vacuum cleaner maybe in the next room, or, uh, if he's got really high food drive, really high ball drive, whatever, set the vacuum cleaner upright, turn it on when it's, when it's like 30 feet away and, and feed him while it's just running 30 feet away you want to desensitize him to that and make him understand that it's not a big deal but by you grabbing it and moving it around and, and shoving it in his face or or you know what what he may think is that you're you're attacking the house with this thing that's making a bunch of loud noises is he's like holy shit what's going on maybe i should attack it is is that that's kind of the the rub with that is that he doesn't get it and he's kind of freaked out by it and so he's he's defaulting to to reactive aggression towards it so you want to desensitize him have it far away, feed him, play ball with him, work on obedience, work on impulse control, you know, work on, on something where his mind is focused on what you're trying to accomplish while it's running from a farther distance away and then slowly get it closer and closer uh, to where, um, you know, you're, you're desensitizing him to it. You know, once you get a little closer, then, then you're grabbing it. Maybe you just, you have it running and, and you're holding it and then, you know, you make one swipe with it and then you put it up. You know, it's just each dog's going to be a little different in terms of how how uh, minute of a scaling process it's going to take to get them accustomed to it. But that's uh, that's the gist of it. Um, all right, Isabella Sauceda asked, "Does the breed matter when looking for a therapy dog? If yes, any suggestions?" In my opinion, no. Uh, are there some breeds that are generally probably going to lend themselves to be a higher percentage of them? Maybe uh, I, I I'm not really gonna I, I I'm not gonna make any recommendations because again there's good examples and bad examples I mean to me um, it's not about the breed it's about the individual uh, I've seen examples in every breed that would make fantastic therapy dogs and I've seen examples in every breed that would make terrible ones so to me have have your criteria set in your mind of what you're looking for and, and then I would I would go to a shelter and, and take them outside the shelter and run them through some testing. And, and uh, if it's the individual that works, it's the individual that works. Uh, breed be damned. Uh, Poppy Chulo 1026, ain't that a hell of a name. Uh, what would your philosophy on someone attempting to join special forces operations communities? Unfortunately, that's not really in the scope of this, but uh, go to a recruiter, find somebody with that experience and, uh, and, and ask them for, uh, for some guidance on it. This uh, isn't really the, the platform, but um, all right, uh, Hans and Risa, hopefully I'm saying that right. When selecting a new pup or rescue for a companion dog, what things can you do look for to assess their environmental stability and dog reactivity and sociability? Um, what I like to do is take them to an area you can pretty much guarantee that they've never been and, uh, and then you know have them walk around while they're not loaded and drive, i.e. not chasing a ball or you don't have food or anything to distract them and, and you know help carry them through that and see how they react like open stairwells uh slippery floors dark rooms big warehouses home depot and lowe's are great places and uh you know anything that you can throw at them environmentally challenging that, that again you can relatively or comfortably ascertain that they've not been there before to see what how they're going to respond and if they're totally freaked out I'd probably try to find a different dog because otherwise you're going to be dealing with that and going to have to work that dog through those problems. If they're not naturally genetically 
pretty comfortable in, in environments they've never been in. It's going to be really tough to uh, to accommodate. Um, Los sixty one thirty four said asks, uh, can you speak to how best to convey that any dog issues are mostly people based? How do you bring that up when it comes to the clients and handlers that you work with? Are they accepting of it or do they try to disagree? Um, so a couple things. Um, I would say that, uh, you know, you're correct and that um, dog issues are, are mostly people-based. You know, are there instances where it's purely genetic in the dog? Of, of course. Uh, and it's generally the one I just, just addressed is that it's generally nerves. You know, a dog with really thin genetic nerves is something that's really hard to overcome. And that's something that a lot of times they're born with. Uh, and then it, it's exacerbated by um, not exposing them to, to challenging environments at an early age. But um, how I bring that up to people, you just got to shoot them straight. You know, uh, you don't have to be a dick about it, uh, but you have to say, look, here's the deal is that you've created this and here's how you've created it. And to me, that's really the kind of the key is, is to show and explain this is how it was created by you doing X, Y, and Z. This is what's making the dog do this. Here's the good news is that together we can fix it. And that's what I'm telling all you people is that anybody asking these questions, um, you know, most of the problems that you're having have been in, inadvertently created probably by yourself. It's all right. You know, how many mistakes have I made uh, without realizing it? Just about fucking all of them. Um, you know, so don't uh, don't beat yourself up about it. Uh, and in terms of your question, Los, um, you know, just don't be an asshole about it. Just say, look, you know, here's the problem. Here's how it was created. Here's how we're going to fix it keep a positive attitude and, and, uh, you know, how they, how they, ex they're either accepting of it or they're not go about it that way, be tactful and, and, and direct and they either accept it or they don't. If they don't say, well, here's the deal. And if you don't want to hear what I have to say, then find somebody who's going to lie to you. Cause I'm not going to, um, you know, again, like you don't have to be an asshole about it, but, um, tell them, tell them the deal. And, and if, uh, if they tell you to, to blow it out your ass, then move on. Uh, and I wouldn't worry about it, but um, anyway, all right. So, uh, hippie C guns, new to Texas. When do you find is the best time to safely work the dogs? I'm assuming you mean with the heat first thing in the morning, like at sun up, um, and then very, very brief sessions, uh, you know, during the day where you're not, uh, overheating them, uh, often, but very short ones. And then again at, you know, at dusk when it's, uh, it's still going to be a little warmer than it was, uh, at sun up, but, uh, but cooler than, you know, the middle of the day and, and, uh, just do your best with it. Um, all right, Chuck Mason, Tennessee. I've got a pit mix, and he chews everything. How can I get him to stop? Uh, you've got to regulate him. You know, crate him. Other than when you're working with him, teach him that he can't chew things. Redirect it. Um, you know, structure is going to be your best friend with that. Is that you've got to use a crate, uh, have him on a leash when you're walking him through the house, and, and and teach, focus on you, teach him place commands, downstays, things of that nature, so that you're giving him things to think about. Uh, and you can't just let him roam freely. Uh, if you're not there to either keep him from doing it, redirect him, teach him not to do it, um, you know, you're, he's, he's not going to figure that out on his own. One other uh, quick tip, don't let him chew on anything in the house, uh, especially with dogs that are naturally really orally fixated that way. Uh, I don't like to have any toys in the house because to the dog, he doesn't know the difference between a Kong and your tennis shoes, generally speaking. Um, and if they're naturally trying to put their mouth on everything, teach them that everything is off limits inside the house and don't let them play with toys in the house, uh, for a while until you can get a handle on it, uh, if ever, but, uh, that's how I would do it. Um, all right. So 19 hammer, um, 79, seeing some pictures of military dogs with metal teeth. Is that from them damaging their teeth or for better penetration? Uh, what is the biggest difference in skill level between a regular military dog um, and, say, a dog that, that they use in a Tier 1 group? Um, first part of your question, yes, uh, metal teeth are, are used or are, are capped, rather, when, um, when dogs damage their teeth, cracked, uh, cracked teeth, split teeth, uh, broken tips. That's all it's for. It's, it's to protect their teeth. It does not enhance their capabilities to bite whatsoever. Uh, a lot of people, it looks mean and, and intimidating and cool and whatever, but uh, it, it's not. I've got a dog with all four of them done because three of them are, are are screwed up. And I did the fourth one just so that it wouldn't be screwed up because he, you know, is is uh, prone to, to fuck his teeth up. But, uh, yeah, it, it doesn't, doesn't have any, any type of capability enhancement whatsoever. 
Biggest difference in skill level, uh, it's a scalability thing uh, between a regular MWD and a, and a, and a special operations dog is that, um, you know, the dog is going to have to be a little more capable because of the types of missions that they go on and, and what they're having the dog do. The expectations are a little higher, so the, the capability is going to have to be a little bit higher. But, um, you know, that's that's really it. <clears throat> um, all right. Uh, behind the shield, uh, asked about the, the heat. I already answered that one, brother. So uh, just refer to my, my earlier post or uh, answer to the, the heat question. Um, let's see. S52M Coop, male versus female mannerisms, obedience, et cetera. Is it safe to, to assume they serve different purposes? Uh, I, I don't think it's safe to assume that. I don't, I don't see a huge difference dog training-wise uh, between males and females. I really don't. Uh, to me, shaping is shaping. Training is training. Um, I, don't, I don't find that there's enormous contrast between the two. That's, that's my opinion. Uh, Sam Bones Jones 25, what are your thoughts on e-collars? We use dog trail on our GSD, but it seems to be a very controversial dog topic. I agree it is. My thoughts on them is that they are a tool. Uh, they are one of many tools in which um, can be used to train a dog. Uh, do I use them? I do. Uh, do I use them fresh out of the gate to teach or shape behaviors and, and desired uh, you know, obedience and things of that nature. I do not. Uh, and I do not recommend that either. I, I use them towards the end of the training process. If, uh, my relationship and bond with the dog coupled with lots of repetitions of scaled shaping and reinforcing through positive reinforcement, um, have gotten the dog to a point where after all of that, where I know he knows what the expectations are and, the, and my criteria is, and I've given him sufficient and ample repetitions that I know that he understands what it is. And at that point, if the dog still, um, you know, wants to self reward or, or his drive is, is at a level where it's uh, commensurate with uh, needing to use positive punishment, then yes, I absolutely will go that route. Uh, where I think it's it becomes a controversial training topic is is in two ways, and that one it's misunderstood by a lot of the people. Just like guns, most people that are trying to ban guns don't have a fucking clue about them. Uh, most people that are uh, abhorrent uh, to the use of uh, e-collars don't have a fucking clue about them. Have never used one, have never had one used on them, and don't even understand how they fucking work. Um, so that's number one. Number two is that you know there are trainers and um, institutions or uh, companies that uh, use remote collars as the backbone and kind of training foundation of, of their teaching, and, and I do disagree with that. Um, that's my take on it, uh, and I think you know when I see dogs being trained out of the gate, they don't understand what's being accepted, expected of them. They don't know what sitting down and all these other things mean, and, and to me, when you're using positive punishment, to you know manipulate a dog into a certain position that's not a good good positive way to teach it whereas if they're working through self-discovery to get reinforced through positive means i think it's a far more impactful frankly faster if you're doing it right and your timing is good um positive uh, good and it, it's a it's a better and more positive way to to do it i'm not the touchy feely guy if you hadn't hadn't gotten gotten that from the way i conduct myself on these podcasts but uh but just like with kids and, and with anybody else that you're trying to teach is that the learning environment needs to be overwhelmingly positive. Yes, there has to be consequences for actions. And yes, I will absolutely get in a dog's ass if it's warranted. But not when the dog is confused, not when the expectations aren't understood, not when I'm emotional about it, and not after, not past when the behavior that I'm trying to extinguish with positive punishment uh, ceases. Um, so that's, uh, that's my take. Um, all right, Green loves to hunt. Uh, any advice on getting a food stealing, not food aggressive, nine month old Catahoula leopard dog to stop? He swipes food from my kids' plates when they are not looking or jumps on counters when no one is around. I try to work with him on it, but he knows when I am and won't repeat stealing the food. My wife keeps jumping on me to buy an e collar, but I'm a team dog member month one, and I'd like to keep working with him instead. He's super food reward driven but I just can't catch him within time that's conducive to learning. By the time I get to him, the learning moment seems like it's past. You are correct. And I'm going to answer your question with your question. Um, is that, 
When you say he swipes food from my kids' plates when they're not looking or jumps on counters when, here's the, the thing I'm going to reiterate is no one is around. If no one is around, a nine-month-old dog who doesn't know what's expected of him should not be allowed or have access to kids' plates or counters with food on them. Uh, of course he's going to jump up on top of them and grab them. He needs to be in a crate or on a leash when you can work with him and build hundreds, if not thousands, of repetitions of being taught, don't mess with that while you're there over and over and over and over until he gets a little older and has enough repetitions under his belt. Put him in a crate. Don't let him uh, swipe food from kids' plates. There is no way he's going to self-regulate at nine months uh, when he's super food driven, you've got to use food to your advantage to teach impulse control. Uh, keep going through the process. I'm ecstatic that you're a member. Uh, stick with it. Just the only thing I would add is is crate him. Um, in the uh, in the meantime, so uh, stick with that. Scooby the Doobie uh, asks, "Do you have any book recommendations for working dogs, like training books for nose work or other dog sports?" Um, Specific to, to certain dog sports, I mean, it depends on the dog sport. Uh, in terms of nose work, um, there's not a book that I can think of that I would recommend uh, right now for nose work. Uh, if somebody has one that they would like my review on, feel free to, to let me know. But I have not seen, you know, to me, nose work is, is a particular enough and specific enough skill <clears throat> to where um, I've not seen a book that's complete enough to where I would recommend it uh, off the top of my head. I would, however, say that there is a book um, that's called, um, you know, what the hell is it called? I'll have to, uh, I'll have to pull it up here. But it's, uh, it's by a gentleman named Simon Prin- Prins uh, and uh, Rude Hack and Rezzy Garretts. And all, they're all Dutch uh, folks that, that got together. Uh, and it's, a, it's a, a basic training book, essentially, of, uh, of how to in- include operant conditioning. Um, and uh, Training Behavior Basics is what it's called. Um, and it, it's a phenomenal book. Um, it's one that I have. I've bought it probably 10 times because every time I've loaned it to somebody, I've never gotten it, <laughs> never fucking gotten it back. Um, but anyway, it's a great book. Uh, obviously, I'm a little biased to tell you that my, my book, Team Dog, is, is a good basic training reference, in my opinion, of course. But, um, but yeah, I, I do like... Uh, um, the the book that I just referenced is uh, is also a good one. Let me uh, uh, sorry for the quick uh, quick interruption. It's Canine Behavior Basics, is what it's called. So yeah, Canine Behavior Basics by uh, Rude Hawk, Rizzy Garretson, and uh, Simon Prins. Um, great uh, great book for uh, for how to you know basically use operant conditioning into um, into you know dog dog not just dog training from uh from a broad perspective it's probably a little in the weeds for your average everyday dog owner but for trying to incorporate it into um you know working environments at a little higher level it's a it's a really good resource shout out to simon rude and resi but uh all right uh rowan birch asks uh, or says got two german two-year-old german shepherds who walk well on the lead but as soon as they're let off the lead they become very hyper and disobedient for five minutes how to control this Again, teach them how to be controlled in your classroom off leash first and scale the distra- distractions up from there. Lots of repetitions are going to be your best friend. Best practices, uh, canine J. Wade, best practices in using a dog tra e collar so the canine won't become equipment oriented. It's a great question. Uh, desensitization. So I would have, have the e collar on the dog when you're not training it. Uh, I would put the e collar on the dog first thing in the morning and take it off last thing at night or when it's being crated. Uh, as to not, uh, you know, cause any irritation with the collar, be careful and cognizant, keep, uh, keep a close eye on the dog's neck to where it's not doing that. But you need to balance the amount of time that when you're not training that that e-collar is on vice just training as that's when they're going to become collar wise. And that, that highlights that a plus B equals C principle is that the, if they, they make that association with a collar on a, um, while I'm training and it gets used B, uh, is, is equal C is, is that's the only time it's on and I need to, that's the only time I need to listen to it essentially, uh, or, or adhere to, to what you're telling them is, is because that association with the e-collar is made. But when you're only putting it on, when you're training, that dog figures that out really quick. So 
when it's on the, the association is we're training and I need to listen when it's off we're not training and I don't need to listen so keep it on all the time um, and most specifically at a minimum at least balance the amount of time where it's on at least as much as when you're training as when you're not training uh, Hunter W how to train dogs in a German language I'm going to sound like a smart ass here but uh, learn German uh, I don't know what else to tell you on that one buddy uh, Logan's burn. I've got an eight week old pup that absolutely hates his crate. He doesn't stop crying when he's locked up. Uh, how can I teach him? Blah, blah, blah. So again, I already addressed this. Use it just like anything else. You know, think of the place command. I've got a video where I teach both place and crate several times, but, uh, you want to make the positive associations with that. Teach him to go in there, you know, do multiple training sessions a day where you're teaching the dog to go in and out of the crate. Uh, so that they, they view it as a component to your training process. Uh, Sebastian underscore actual suggestions on curbing separation anxiety and barking when crated. Um, same thing, you know, exact same answer essentially is use the crate to train. Uh, Z Cooper 17, what do you do if your dog doesn't like to wear a harness, he freaks out and freezes up or hides, doesn't eat or go into the bathroom, he's a six-month-old Australian Shepherd. So here's um, just another good example of desensitizing the dog to that through uh, positive means is that and you, you're, you're, it sounds like as, as detrimental of an impact as this has had on the dog that you're going to have to scale it way back probably to an annoying degree uh, where you're just holding the harness and petting the dog and it's right there with him. You know, if, if he's even freaked out by you holding it, if that's the case, then you're going to have to go all, all the way back to that where you know, get him used to it, get him, you know, then just put it on his head and, and you know, mark and reward that uh, or put peanut butter on your hands or, or what, you know, whatever you can do to uh, make some good positive associations with that harness first to where at a minimum it's neutral before you're even trying to put them on, put it on them, um, you know, get to that point first and then very slowly, you know, it's one leg on and then it's just, you know, or it's just draped around his neck and then it's one leg on and you know, it may take a couple of weeks or even several months to desensitize him to that point, but that's how you want to do it is make a bunch of positive associations that he's going to say, wow, every time, you know, the harness comes out, good things happen is that, that that's how you're going to, going to start that process and, and scale it up. Um, Fletch Nasty has, uh, says, I have an older German shepherd who's three years old and is pretty obedient when it comes to the basic sit and stay, all praise driven. Definitely could be better, though. I know it's based on personality, but any tips to take him to the next level? I would beg to differ. I don't think it's based on personality. Uh, I also am not a big fan of using praise-driven rewards unless that's the only thing that the dog responds to, which all dogs will respond to food. I would also ask, are you using a, a marker in conjunction with your primary reinforcer of praise so that your timing is associating with these basic sit and stay and obedience behaviors with the praise because that's the rub is that the dog needs to understand it's 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 his actions that are determining the consequences and that's why i like to use a tangible reward such as food praise can work and there are times where i would recommend it however uh the the big important component is using a marker so that uh you know so that the dog understands that it's it's his behavior and and, and his actions coupled with your good timing and using the marker that's resulting in the reward that you're that you're doling out to them so that's what's going to take them to the next level is is that understanding is your timing with a marker being spot on so that that, that association is made um and i again i would do it in the classroom and, and similar to how i i have it set up with the with the online stuff but all right, uh, Chris Lowry, 26, says, how long should discipline last when the dog has done something wrong? My dog hides under the table when he knows he's done something wrong. Eventually, he comes out. Is it on his schedule or is it making it a certain time? Okay, so a couple things is that there's, again, there's an anthropomorphization component to this of he knows he did something wrong. When I see that is that, again, that's a, a misconception that people have when they think that the dog gets that. It, it I, I would bet that it has more to do with uh, with your your emotion um, and what you're doing than it does uh, with the dog. Now, are there times where you don't even know that something's been done wrong and the dog looks at you? Yeah, they can make the association with they know what's coming um, in in some instances, but but most times, um, you know, it's it's more based on your reaction and what's going on with you now. Um, in terms of the discipline, how long it should last, here's where dogs and humans um, 
don't are you know very drastically um, and that is where it's as soon as the behavior ceases you know putting a dog in a timeout makes no fucking sense to a dog you know to a seven-year-old that understands i did this and you say you're gonna go sit here and and not get to do this for an hour i'm taking your ipad for a week dogs don't get that um so here's where 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 you're using punishment uh, or any type of corrective behavior is that you know it's to extinguish something when that something ceases the punishment ceases and that's what's teaching the dog that hey you can turn the punishment off is that when when you're doing something wrong i'm going to apply i.e positive adding punishment and when that punishment is added your behavior stops as soon as it stops the punishment stops your your timing has to be just as accurate and spot on as it does with positive excuse me positive reinforcement in that you know when the behavior that you're looking for takes place the instant it takes place it gets marked and it gets rewarded in this case it's the exact opposite is that um, you know the correction is applied the instant the undesirable behavior ceases the punishment goes away and so you're you're just keeping it very black and white and making that stark contrast um, Pat underscore Delaney seven says my dog gets testy around other dogs but is perfect with myself and girlfriend. It seems like he goes through phases of liking dogs and then not liking them. He's a lab pit mix. What are your thoughts on thoughts on to correct this behavior when these incidents happen? All right. So first things first, uh, I doubt that it's phases of liking dogs and then not liking them. It, it, my guess is that it would probably have more to do with the individual dogs that he's getting into it with, what they're doing, how they're carrying themselves, whether or not they're intact, their their temperament, et cetera, than it does phases on on his uh, part in terms of deciding. Um, having said that, um, you know, again, to me, the, the best way to get a dog to ignore everything else is to focus on you. And you'll hear me say this over and over and over is that it's not about the dog that they're having a problem with. It's the fact that what you want to teach your dog is that no matter what's going on, if you give him a command to heal, that he's focused on you and, and will heal through anything or come back to you, you know, recalling and healing those two things, especially in succession, recall back to me and then heal. And then we walk through the gates of hell, if that's what it takes, is that you teach him to do that under every circumstance. And that's going to be your best friend. Then it doesn't matter what the other dog is doing. It, it plays no role, you know, whether a dog's trying to kill him, whether a dog's trying to hump him, whatever is that, um, you know, provided, you, you know, obviously not, not hump them in terms of physically trying to do it, but, but having that, um, that dominance, um, outward, um, character, uh, you know, trait kind of exuding on your dog. If, if that's what they're bringing to the table, that's going to piss a lot of, a lot of other dogs off. Um, but regardless is that no matter what another dog is doing shy of attacking your dog. And in that case, it's a different story, but uh, everything else is that the dog is focused on you and then and it's marked and rewarded. And so um, teach that dog again in your classroom, tons of repetitions of, of focusing and then you're scaling up your distractions uh, from there. Flipper Jones 18. Hey, Mike, I have a three year old German chip, uh, German short haired pointer. She's uh, a sweet dog, but gets way too excited when people are around. She's always been high energy. Uh, any advice on how to calm an extremely high ball drive over excitement? Same way. Uh, impulse control is taught through repetition, uh, reinforcement schedules of teacher place command, go lay on your place. You know, if, if, uh, when people are around, if it's out in public and the teacher to focus on you, like I just said, if it's in your house, teacher to go to a place and stay on it and, and, and do tons of repetitions and build on that. So the, the thing that I want everybody to realize is that, you know, when dogs are focused on something else and it's, and it's inciting, whatever it is, whether it's aggression, whether it's prey drive, whether it's nervousness, whether it's reactivity, none of it, it doesn't matter what that reaction is or what, what, what's being uh, elicited because of what they're focused on. What you need to, to realize is that it, it's, it's the absence of them paying attention to anything else that what, that is what you're trying to teach. Uh, every one of those instances will be solved by teaching your dog to pay attention to you. So, you know, if she's excited when other people are around, we'll make her associate every time somebody else new comes in, she focuses on you and gets paid for it. Now she's not excited about other people. She doesn't give a shit. Now, every time she sees somebody new, she turns around and focuses on you. Like, why wouldn't you want that? 
uh, and, and you can build on that. You can teach it to somebody. You know, there's a knock on the door. That means you go lay down in your place. You can make those associations. Somebody walks through the door, same thing, uh, or comes over to you and lays down. I mean, there, there's a, however you want to uh, teach that dog to do whatever it is that you want to do instead of being a pain in your ass, teach them to do that through positive reinforcement and making that association with that stimulus. Uh, and, it's, and it really is that simple. Um, all right, uh, Eric Shenton, just kind of an off topic, but uh, how do we get some of our soon to be retired red tag MWDs into the Warrior Dog Foundation? Uh, email us, uh, go to warriordogfoundation.org and uh, go through the proper channels of, of emailing the, uh, the leadership there and, uh, and we'll, we'll get you fixed up. Uh, Animal Mother Actual says, what are your thoughts on physical training with dogs? As a kid, I would take my pit bull on trail runs. Looking back, even though I enjoyed it, is that something people should do with their dogs? Yeah, absolutely. Um, be careful with it in that, you know, when they're young, I'd be a little little reserved in terms of how much uh, physical strenuous activity you're putting on them. But, uh, yeah, absolutely. Uh, play with your dogs and, and, and be active with them. Um, let's see. Use ten zero or... I think it's used ten zero. Is it possible to teach an older dog SAR training? She's three or three years old. Yes, uh, with the caveat of provided she has the genetic drive that uh, is required and appropriate for that type of work. Yes. Um, let's see. Ryan Jeans. I uh, I have a Malinois with great obedience on and off leash and e collar trained and a little bit of protection bite work training and life happens. We get busy buying, building a home, travel, kids, etc. How long does it take for a dog to backtrack on training and how easy is it for them to relearn? Okay, so it, it depends. Um, how long does it take for a dog to backtrack with no training? Uh, is one of the things I say a lot. No training is better than bad training. So if the dog's being crated, kenneled, relatively neutral environments where it's not being able to get dirty and self-reward and get sloppy and, and have all of these reinforcements that are going against what you've taught, then it, it doesn't take very long at all. Um, it can happen in a matter of days uh, or weeks, you know, to really screw a dog up if somebody's doing it, you know, the wrong way in reverse. Um, how long does it take to relearn? Again, it, it depends on how, how good of a trainer you are, how driven the dog is, how many sessions you're getting in in a day, how consistent you are. Uh, how structured your schedule is. Um, the short answer is it, it can be also, you know, a matter of days or weeks if the training that, that was there was really, really good and and it hasn't been, you know, hasn't detracted from that too significantly and, and you're a good trainer and you're consistent and structured and scheduled and all that, it, it, you can make that turn around fairly quick. Uh, but it can, it can go to the other end of the extreme if uh, you know, if, if they're, if the tan intangibles are set up against you in, in the manner in which I, uh, outlined, um, Dutchie underscore Dulia. I have a Dutch shepherd and I'm just getting a mal, both females, best practices on successful pack integration. Um, good question. Common one crates. Uh, I like to use crates and, and work with the dogs individually until they're both relatively where I want them. Uh, and then I'm going to integrate them together where they we're doing impulse control and they're both doing downstays and just having them what i like to do is, is have them created by each other you know have them where they're in close proximity to one another but they don't have the ability to physically be in contact with one another and you're and you're working with them individually and as you know if, if the existing uh, dutch shepherd you have is already kind of where you want them then you know work on the on the mal and get them to where um, you can at least control them and not have them invading personal space and things like that um, and then integrate them slowly that way so created together not not together in the same crate but you know in close proximity to one another where they can hear see smell each other uh, for you know weeks months however long it takes to get the new dog kind of to where you want it uh, and then slowly start to integrate it from there where there's some rules and boundaries so that you're not uh, setting them up for failure how do you teach a dog to ignore cats and not chase them? Uh, again, sound like a broken record. Teach the dog to focus on you. Lots of repetitions. Train it in your classroom. Uh, scale up from there. If after all of that you still can't, then I would use positive punishment and and, uh, and extinguish that behavior through through punishment. Uh, but try it through uh, all the other ways first. Uh, tra tips on transitioning from a low drive dog to high. Is this okay for pet owners to do when you're wanting to get into dog sports? Yeah, absolutely. How to transition? Have fun. Because uh, it's going to be way more fun having a high drive dog after going from a low drive dog in terms of training. You can use all of that drive to your advantage. 
JPD 1130. Real quick before I answer your question, uh, I just want to give a shout out and a thank you to Jillian, uh, who has been with us for almost two and a half years now um, and has been a phenomenal addition to the team, does a fantastic job. Uh, with both the warrior dogs and uh, and all of the Tricos dogs, can't thank you enough. Um, you've been been a wonderful asset here, and uh, and I I'm glad to have you. Appreciate uh, all your hard work. So so thank you, ma'am. Um, your question is: What dog was your most challenging to work with, and what was your biggest breakthrough moment with him, her, in your training? There's been a. It's really hard to to pinpoint or uh, pick just one. Um, having said that. Um, I think the one that, that just comes to mind in reading this question is the very first uh, kind of herder that I ever had was a Dutch Shepherd. Um, and to me, you know, the reason he was challenging is, is probably the most challenging is because it was the first one I ever had. And it was a dog that uh, was a, it was a former, um, we'll call it a special operations dog in, in a different country, uh, an anti-terrorism you know, kind of tier one unit dog. Uh, and it was the first time I'd ever had one of, of these dogs. And, uh, you know, so there was a pretty steep learning curve and drinking from the fire hose, as it were. Um, to me, the biggest breakthrough moment with him, honestly, was, was when I finally realized that he did not give a flying fuck about me. <laughs> and uh, it took a couple of years. But that was kind of my breakthrough moment with him was that, you know, it wasn't personal. You know, and, and that's that's where it really changed my mentality and into both working dogs and dogs in general is that some of them are just self-serving pricks that don't give a shit about you, no matter what. Now, that doesn't mean that you can't use lots of reinforcement to get all of the things that, that we're talking about accomplished because you can. And, and to me, that's what, that's A, the beauty of, of this type of training and B, and I think more importantly, is, is why it's so important. Uh, why it's so crucial to to use these types of techniques is because then you're you're not um, you're not betting on or or um, you know relying solely on your ability to to maintain a relationship with the dog. It makes a huge difference, but there are some dogs that that they just do not give a shit. Uh, almost no matter what. I mean, I, I had the dog for almost four years, and uh, you know. When I when I sold him to a to a different uh, individual in in the dog world, um, you know, even even up until that point, after having him that that amount of time, like that dog, if I did him wrong and and was unfair in my corrections or or in my training regimen, he would absolutely bite the shit out of me, um, you know. And it wasn't personal; it was just you know he had his left and right flank and and what he was willing to put up with and. I mean, I trained him to a very high level or got him back to a very high level. He, he was already fairly well trained when I got him. Uh, but I learned a lot from him uh, in, in those ways uh, and, and was able to do a lot of other things with him through just training schedules and reinforcement that if I had been trying to use punishment, it, it would have never worked. Uh, unquestionably, it would have never worked because uh, I'd have been wearing him. And I did a, a few times. He bit the shit out of me several times. Um, once while driving at 75 miles an hour, like a total dumbass, I had him loose in my front seat. And that was one of the, the lessons learned that I see people relearning, even though I, I tell that story on a, on a number of occasions. But that was my biggest breakthrough moment with him was, was realizing that it's, it's the training schedules, um, that if done right, um, you know, are, are, you know, what's going to transcend everything. It's not to take away from the relationship because that does make a huge difference uh, with a dog that's conducive to that. But it made me realize that some of them, albeit not very many of them, but some of them do not give a shit and never will give a shit. So uh, that was it. And again, thank you for, uh, for all your hard work. Uh, Jay Schiff, 91, is it possible or reasonable to manage and train multiple dogs at once to save time? I have a squared away GSP that I'm trying to teach more advanced techniques and then I inherited my wife's not so squared away dogs that are learning the basics. Thoughts about making the clicking sound with my mouth instead of a clicker. What kind of dog is that beautiful black beast sitting next to you in the profile picture? All right, so first of all, my answer is no. I would not try to teach um, your dogs at the same time uh, individually until they're all where you want them to be or they're going to be confused as shit. Uh, don't use the clicker sound with your mouth. Use a clicker. People say, well, I lose the clicker. Well, don't fucking lose the clicker. You know, you have car keys. Don't fucking lose them, right? Or you're not going anywhere. It's the same thing. 
um, you know, there, there are certain things that just put, put a higher intrinsic value on a clicker and stop fucking losing it if that's what the problem is. Um, and that's generally most people's, well, what if I don't have it? Well, fucking have one. Um, you know, it, it really is that simple is that if you want to get to the next level and, and have advanced techniques and have a really super squared away group of dogs is that you've got to train them individually. You've got to use a, a consistent clicker with, uh, you know, with the same tone inflection, sound, mechanical noise every time. It's not going to be the same with your mouth. Um, and also don't do the training where the other dogs can hear you training that other dog. Um, even if they're crated, I, I would not do that. Uh, I would take the dog out where they're not going to be able to hear that and confuse them. Um, the dog sitting next to me, his name is Yori. Uh, he is a black Malinois. Um, and he is a, a gorgeous little son of a bitch, but a uh, nice, nice dog. Um, I don't know how to pronounce this. Nasif, Nasarafi. Um, can you talk about CBD oil and how they help retired MWDs? Great question. Um, the CBD oil, it's pretty significant. Uh, I take it myself. Uh, I give a number of our dogs it uh, and have. Um, there's a number of ways, and I would, inc I would encourage you guys, again, it's going to sound like a shameless plug, but um, go on trichosupplements.com. Um, you know, instead of me list, <clears throat> listing off pages of benefits, uh, in short, cognition, uh, reduce of inflammation helps with anxiety. Um, there's a, a ton of other things, but those are the big ones with dogs who, you know, have PTS or, uh, behavioral issues, separation, anxiety, things that I've seen, uh, you know, significant impact, just like with everything, you know, it works on some better than others. You know, I've seen some dogs, most dogs uh, have a significant positive impact. Have I seen dogs where it, it, it hasn't had as significant of an impact? Yes. Just like with medications and human beings is that, uh, you know, they respond differently, but there's a reason why, um, I partnered with a company to, to make it. Um, and, and there's not a lot of other products that you see my name on. There's a reason for that. Um, so, um, I, I strongly believe in it and, uh, and it's good stuff. Again, go to trichosupplements.com to check that out. Um, D Sully 89, if you had to choose one program book slash training plan for the average dog owner who expects great obedience, what would it be? All right. I'm going to sound like a dick here, but, uh, team dog dot pet, go to Mike .com and sign up for my online dog training. That's, that's just the no bullshit. Uh, that's why it exists is that I saw a gap. Uh, it's 84 bucks a year uh, for $7 a month. Um, there's a ton of fucking content. There's uh, interaction. There's forums where I get on every Mondays and answer questions uh, on the forums as well as, and I'm going to take a minute to thank all of the, I mean, there's thousands of people in those forums that, uh, that provide awesome insight, uh, post videos of their own experiences that are, are fantastic. And I mean, it's to the point now where I get on there, like most of the questions are already answered by other phenomenal members um you know so i can't thank the members enough for putting the time into the forums but again i get on there and, and solidify some of the answers or uh, answer things that haven't been answered uh, or that are directed at me personally whatever but um it's a tra it's a cumulative training process that goes month by month um and and outlines kind of the process in which i'm, I'm talking about all of these things and uh you know that that's what i would recommend it's uh, it's very inexpensive for for what you get out of it in my opinion but that's that's the point of it so I would I would do it, or choke yourself. Uh, J Nort fifty two shepherds or Malinois. Uh, my answer to that is yes. Uh, Swamp thing for president. Um, my man, what can I do in order to curb my pups biting, chewing on people or unwanted furniture? Similarly, uh, crate other than when you're working with them. Uh, redirect and uh, try to positively shape through reinforcement what you want. There does come a time, even when in, in a young pup, where you may have to, uh, you know, redirect in terms of getting into their uh, into their backside just a little bit. But you got to be really careful with puppies, and I, I try to do that as little as possible. Generally speaking, just by creating, exercising, wearing them out, and then positively shaping and reinforcing your desired behaviors is going to curb most of that. Uh, so stick stick to that and kind of the process that I that I outline in the online stuff. Um, Red Wolf or RD Wolf 76. I have a two year old German Shepherd, very sensitive stomach, so he's on a raw diet. What can you recommend for training with treats? He was trained at a board and train program with an e collar. 
uh, trying to change up his reward, trying to chain up his training with a reward-based program. I'm happy to hear that. I think you're going to have much better results with it in terms of uh, reliability, uh, in, in improving your relationship tenfold with him. Um, in terms of you know training treats, um, I like to use the frozen Bill Jack food. Um, Munster also, um, I've, I've just partnered with, or I'm starting to partner with in terms of. Um, some of their raw training treats um, that I would uh, I would absolutely recommend, um, and uh, you'll be seeing some of those from me here soon. But uh, uh, yeah, uh, the the short answer is you you gotta you gotta pick uh, you gotta you know experiment with a bunch of other stuff and and see what uh, you know what what can uh, what what's gonna work and what you know what's not gonna upset the dog's stomach, but. Um, all right. Uh, let's see. I got time for one more here. Um, a lot of these questions, honestly, are um, are kind of all ones that I've either answered or the answer is the same. Uh, let's see. Best place to start sourcing pups for training. Um, I haven't been asked that one yet, so I'll talk about that real quick. Um, and this is a good question, whether it's puppies or grown dogs, rescues, whatever, is that, you know, one thing that I recommend uh, real heavily in, in my book, Team Dog, is, you know, it, it's a couple of things you want to look for is that, um, you know, essentially you, you've got to understand what is your goal. And this is with everything in life, whether it's working out, whether it's what you want to do for a living, personal relationships, whatever, um, is that you know you've got to you've got to have kind of a finished product of what you're trying to accomplish, and then you're going to work backwards from that. So, you know, to me, sourcing pups for training well, it depends on the training. You know, um, whatever the training is, whatever that that finished product uh, that that you have in your mind uh, of what it's supposed to look like or what it does look like, is that you want to take that and say, okay, this is what I want. Now, who is the best at providing puppies that that accomplish that uh, in the highest percentages? And and it really is that simple. Um, you know, so it really just it depends on the type of training that, that you're going for, um, you know, and then again, find uh, the most reputable people from from there. And, and by reputable, it's not just, oh, they have a nice website and their pictures are real high quality and their dogs look badass. Like it, it's what have they produced? What have the dogs done? And, and have they done what you're looking to accomplish? If all you want is a dog that looks nice, then, you know, whatever uh, to each their own. But um but that that's the deal like if if by training you mean you know from a working capacity it's 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 what working capacity is it police is it military is it search and rescue is it agility is it sports is it you know hunting you know um it just depends but whatever that medium is that you want to excel at you know find find uh, breeders who have a great reputation and and more importantly a proven track record for supplying successfully supplying dogs with great percentage numbers that uh, that accommodate that or, or accomplish that rather um so there's a ton of other questions uh, i am out of time um however one of the things that you know i'm, I'm going to wrap it up here with one quick quick note of um you know essentially the the things that i notice uh, that people are asking all kind of stem from the same problem and it's generally relates to a lack of structure um, and then a lack of using reinforcement to shape dogs' learning process through self-discovery. And that's the backbone of, of my online training program is, is that, is that, um, you know, you've got to structure the dog's environment and remove all these other stimulus stimuli that you're competing with early on so that you can lay that foundation so that the dog absolutely understands what's expected of them and, and can learn through self-discovery and you can shape and reinforce all of these desirable behaviors for the number of repetitions until it gets to be a, a conditioned response, a learned behavior. Uh, once it's at that point, then you're going to slowly start to scale up distractions and, and make more challenging environments, get outside your classroom, bring the training classroom out into the real world and, and scale it from there, depending on what the dog can handle and, and, and what kind of success you're having. And, uh, and just incrementally increase, you know, the, the challenges to where, you know, the dog is focused on you no matter what's going on. And he'll recall and heal a lot of things and down and stay and go to place and bark when you tell him to, shut up when you tell him to. Uh, you know, he's conditioned in the house to not chew on stuff. He's conditioned in the house not to swipe anything because you've taught him that. Um, you know, do e-collars and positive punishment play a role? Yes, but if you'll notice... 
for anybody that, that goes on the site and checks out the online training schedules, it, it's not until the sixth month where I start talking about giving dogs corrections, you know, so there's a reason for that. Um, and it's because the relationship and the reinforcement schedule uh, plays such a key role and is uh, so much more valuable in terms of getting your dog where you want it to be that, uh, that that's why it's structured that way. But again, you know, there's, there's a lesson every month, uh, video and, and text to accompany, accompany it. There's blog posts, there's gear reviews, there's, you know, tips for, for heat and, and food and nutrition and uh, vet uh, vet tips and and you name it. There's a it's a it's a resource. It's a, a resource driven dog site uh, that I've created to to give people um, you know all of these um, training components uh, in a in a tangible form that you can actually interpret and, and apply to everyday use. And it is very simple. You do have to put some time in, just like with anything that uh, that's worth a shit or worth doing, is that you've got to you got to dedicate some time to it. You don't have to become a professional dog trainer and spend nine hours a day doing it. No, uh, but you you do have to to dedicate yourself to that animal, especially early on. And if you put that time in early on and are nice and consistent, and, and uh, you know show show them what the expectations are at a large degree, then uh, you know it's a lot easier to maintain uh, as the dog goes on. So. Uh, again, go to MikeRitland.com, um, check out the online training, TeamDog.pet, if you want to go direct, 84 bucks a month, it's good shit, um, and yeah. Uh, anyway, so this has been uh, that episode, the second episode um, of uh, Team Dog Zero Two. Uh, hopefully, uh, I've answered some of your guys' questions, uh, and you guys got something out of this. Uh, if not, feel free to choke yourself, as always, and uh I hope everybody has a, a good, positive relationship with their dog, keeps kicking ass, go further. And uh, we will see you guys next time. This is Mike Brown.